All right, so welcome to our Faculty Center panel about student engagement um, during the COVID shutdown. I am really happy to see you. And I wanna say thank you to online education and to the embedded online technologists, especially because we were planning this event where we we're all going to be together in person in the Goldfield Room and Leeds Library. And we we're going to have coffee and pastries and we we're going to talk about student engagement and i got great ideas and recommendations from the embedded online technologists and then we had to switch plans um, but i'm very grateful that four panelists agreed to be super flexible and just go with this and uh, talk today about what they're doing to engage students so um, i'm going to share some slides So this, this is us today. We are doing this on Zoom instead of in person. Um, my name is Melissa Bowles Terry, if we haven't met. I'm the Associate Director of the Faculty Center. And um, a couple of notes as we get started. Um, the format today is we're going to hear from four fabulous instructors. We're going to hear from David Copeland from Psychology, then Jarrett Keen from English, um, Katie Rafferty from Life Sciences, and then Sean Slattery from Art. Uh, while they speak, please feel free to go ahead and put your comments and questions in the chat, and I'll be monitoring that and we'll ask them your questions once each person has spoken. Um, and I would also ask everyone who's not a panelist to mute yourselves um, so that we don't get any interference um, and we can hear the speakers. So that is the plan for today. And uh, with that, I will turn it over to David. Well, hello, everyone. Um, my name is David Copeland. Uh, I've been at UNLV for probably about a dozen years now. I'm the undergraduate director in psychology, been teaching both in person and online for a number of years now. Um, I want to talk a little bit about some of the you know, most effective techniques that I use to engage students, especially in an online setting. And uh, probably the number one uh, tip that I could provide that I've learned is communicate, communicate, communicate. Uh, the big difference uh, between online and in person is in person, you're going to physically see them a couple times, if not three times a week. Uh, they know they can probably stop by your office at various times. Whereas uh, with the online atmosphere, you can, you know, seem like a ghost, you know, if you're not uh, actively communicating uh, with your students. And so uh, one of the things that, uh, that I try to do with my courses is to regularly communicate, whether it's via email, announcements, uh, new uh, information provided within the course in Canvas. And what it does is it's, it's a little bit more reassuring to students uh, from the feedback that I've gotten from them that uh, they know that you're there, you're available, that, uh, that you're uh, somebody that they can reach. Um, and so, uh, so I think that's a, probably the biggest thing in that so far for my attempts, I've learned that there's no such thing as over communicating unless you're sending, you know, like five emails every single day or something like that. But, uh, but that's probably my number one thing. Number two is uh, just making yourself available to meet with them through various means. Uh, different students have different uh, comfort levels with uh, technology and especially with different types of technology. And so while they're all using Canvas, if we mention to them sometimes like, oh, WebEx or Google Hangouts, sometimes they're just like, oh, wait, you know, that's something I've never used before. I'm not sure if I really want to dive into that. And so uh, I offer things such as uh, FaceTime or uh, Skype. And once, once I make those offers to students, uh, a lot of times they have those apps right there on their phones and they're like, oh yeah, okay, I can do that. And uh, it encourages them a little bit more to get in contact and to, uh, to talk and convey either the things that they're, uh, they need help with or just simple questions they have. Um, and a lot of times a simple conversation that lasts a couple minutes is a lot easier 
in terms of communicating than it is through emails. Because sometimes I'll get students who write a one or two sentence question that turns into a two page response if I had to type it out, whereas I could communicate it in about one minute worth of conversation. So, uh, so I think those are, uh, you know, probably my, my biggest recommendations in terms of engagements. Besides that, I think uh, one advantage we have in psychology is just motivating students by allowing the topics to be connected to their own lives. Uh, I think we mentioned this kind of in the lead up earlier that, you know, kind of trying to personalize or connect to the current circumstances or something, you know, like that. I think that's a very, uh, very easy way in which uh, you can reach students in terms of uh, engagement, because then the material seems a little bit more uh, connected to them and their lives, whether it's just something happening in their daily life or something maybe that they're going to go forward in their future career. But there's lots of ways to do that. And it might not work for every area as easily. Psychology, like I said, you know, one of the things we always say is psychology applies to everything in your daily life. And that, uh, and then so we have a little advantage to it. But if it's something you can do, that's something I highly recommend. Great. Thank you so much, David. Um, if you're just joining us, um, please do put any questions or comments that you have in the chat and we I'll pose those questions to the panelists at the end. Um, next is Jarrett. Hello. Yeah, I just like to uh, build on what uh, David um, expressed about uh, communication. Yeah, I also think uh, I found it very helpful to communicate um, positive energy <laughs> or positive messages. Um, I begin, you know, I, I begin every week with uh, an email update, uh, an announcement, I guess you would call it in web campus, where I remind them to, um, you know, call their grandmothers, uh, eat healthy, do their push-ups, and uh, don't watch the news. And I'm surprised at how, mu how often they come back to me, uh, letting me, giving me updates on those four uh, <laughs> items. Um, a lot of them, of course, are struggling. Um, emotionally with the uh, situation, but I found that that is what uh, they respond to, uh, weirdly enough, in my class, which is American Literature to Post-Civil War American Lit. Um, my WebEx office hours have been a complete failure. No one has ever uh, checked in on me when I'm available Monday and Wednesday for my WebEx uh, sessions. I've even offered my cell number and no one has uh, uh, called me. However, they are communicating with me through um, Canvas, which is wonderful. Um, obviously, I miss the the back and forth of the uh, on the ground uh, classroom meetings, but I found that um, I'm getting better uh, quiz responses. Uh, prior to the uh, campus closure, um, my students were doing well with their quizzes. Uh, the responses were good, but um, I guess I'm not sure what it accounts for this, but their focus on answering the quizzes has been uh, tremendous. Um, they're really digging into uh, the material. I've also scaled back, of course, a lot of the readings. Um, we're focusing a lot more on poetry. Uh, I adjusted the syllabus after the campus closure to zero in on, um, you know, Plath, Sexton. Um, American poets that um, are, you know, wonderful. And so that, I think that has been helpful too. We've skipped some of the, um, the more dour uh, short stories and, and plays and just kind of uh, shifted our emphasis a bit more towards uh, verse. And I don't know, I think the um, keeping things positive, uh, praising them when I can, not all the time, of course, that gets a little uh, condescending, but when I, when I notice that they're really responding and thinking about the material, I make sure to uh, include a note in Canvas and they, re they respond to their notes. And I should also say that it's been a great experience because I've been able to uh, market and push my summer <laughs> and fall classes and I've had a great response. Uh, from the students about my uh, graphic novel class that I'm teaching this summer and in the fall. 
they seem very um, excited about that. I've been conversing with them on that material. And then finally, I just uh, want to say that I'm also, I have a bit of an administrative role in the English department and with Black Mountain Institute and in that I'm uh, editing Witness Literary Magazine. And I've, uh, because of my experience through Canvas, through Web Campus, I've been able to uh, recruit a few um, undergraduate English major interns for uh, summer and fall through the College of Liberal Arts. That's been a real um, uh, cool development. So um, there's been some good things and there's been some uh, a few failures, but overall I think it's uh, been a tremendous experience to keep things um, uh, positive. And, uh, and yes, communication is, uh, is key. Okay, thank you for sharing both the, the pluses and the minuses of our, of our current experience. Um, I see that we have the, the witness website up in the chat. So anyone who wants to check that out, please take a look. Um, next up is Katie. Hi everyone. Um, so I'm in the life science department and I teach uh, large enrollment introductory biology. So I have two sections this semester. I would say that this is the class that is definitely hardest for this transition to online has been hardest. Um, but I, one of the ways that I try to connect, I, I hold four office hours a week through Google Meet. And there's two people that come every day. And for them, this transition has literally been like, I am their tutor four hours a week. So for those two students out of 250 students, like this has actually been a really positive way to connect with me. And, um, but then I probably had 10 students drop in just to ask quick questions in those office hours and then I, I get some emails. So for a lot of them, I am a bit worried, not, well, yeah, I'm worried. <laughs> um, but the strategies, I, I, again, it's a lot of things that you've already heard is one of the major ones is just acknowledging their challenges. So in the announcement feature, you can record messages. So, you know, I'm sending out my face. Uh, I, I, I hope that that is a way that they can see that I am, I, I am still here. I'm not just on the other side of the computer, but a lot of acknowledging the challenges that everyone's facing. And then a way to, to accommodate that is, is we do have a number of assignments, but the assignment windows have been made much longer. So they're well aware of these assignments. Um, and they have longer to complete them. And then um, the clarity of the assignments, I've paid a lot more attention to how are you supposed to do this assignment? What are your expectations? Um, because we can't talk those out in class like we would before. Um, so, you know, for example, the final, they already know exactly what they're, um, going to be expected, the format of the final has already been published. Um, and that was published a little bit ago so that they have been very clear of what's going to be expected of them the rest of the semester. Um, and that seems to be very important uh, to them. And then a lot of reminders of deadlines and things like that. A lot of reminders that, that I am here over email, that I have office hours. Um, now that it's getting close to the, the final test and then the final, I'm getting more requests for some impromptu um, you know, video chats, which is good. And that's also to be expected near the end of any term. I tend to hear more from, from students. Um, my other class is a smaller human genetics class. And that's been a, there's been a lot of positive aspects to that course in moving online specifically that I require them to meet with me um, in video office hours. So we're chatting a little bit more about things that they're connecting the course to in their worlds. Um, and then in the discussion boards, which I had never used discussion boards before, but I'm getting a lot of entries about their personal interests. So, um, 
to the extent that you know COVID-19 um, might be different depending on the genetics of a person. We've had a lot of uh, conversations like that. We're getting into a lot more ethical conversations where my course typically doesn't go there. Um, but I'm noticing that this is an area that students are really interested in. So it's kind of given me an idea of how to direct the course for the future. Um, and uh, so again, there's, there's positives for my upper level class here. And I expect some negatives for my lower level class, for students who don't quite know how to engage with their professors yet. Um, so, you know, I, it'll be interesting to see how the, for the introductory course, how the grades pan out. Um, so that's, that's kind of my area of worry is that intro class. But for my upper level class, it's been actually quite positive. Thank you, Katie. And our last panelist is Sean Slattery from the art department. Good morning, everyone. Um, I, I echo a lot of what everybody has said, so I will try not to repeat that. Um, um, I'm going to concentrate, I think, a, more on the empathy, which has been a real hard, uh, a real uh, focus of, of my online teaching. I, I do art, um, and this semester, art classes are classes means we are not only needing in a large lab, which provides the space for the students to make work um, we deal with hazardous materials which they cannot have at home uh, we deal with one-on-one -on -one instruction uh, first i demo to the whole class they physically see my hands move they physically see the results uh, happen live and then i walk around and and um you know comment directly on them as they're working that's that's impossible on Zoom. So, um, so my first approach when I saw this coming down the line was, was luckily realizing um, that the next few weeks are not going to be normal. And that I think it's important as teachers that remember not to normalize this. We are not just of a five year plan to move UNLV to online. And this is the, the beginning of the big push. We are in a pandemic and we were thrown online. Um, we're all in isolation, just like students. And so I think empathy for our students and for ourselves is a big part of, of being actually effective as teachers this semester. Um, with that said, the syllabus immediately did not become my first priority. Um, and I think a lot of teachers or instructors I've found have uh, a love of their syllabus thinking that it's the only thing, the only way to teach that class. And I think we need to not treat it as sacred. And I've heard some teachers already do that. Um, so the idea of what can we get next few weeks that's the most important thing for our students to get out of this, knowing that, in my opinion, in my classes, everything's out the window. I have to, I have to completely refigure what they're going to get from this class. Um, another thing that's been to me empathy-wise is to be aware of what I'm asking of them technology-wise. Uh, they're familiar with Canvas, they're familiar with Google. I, I've really tried hard not to introduce other apps that are not directly related to the class. Uh, meaning, um, I know Discord is a great place to chat, but Canvas has a chat feature. Uh, I know uh, there's all sorts of wonderful ways online, but they've got a Google address through their UNLV um, email. So trying to keep their cognitive overload down is, is I think, important to having empathy for these students. Um, and the more familiar they are with the tools that they're using suddenly, because um, my class is mostly um, manual, uh, it, it, I see more engagement. So when I go to the chat in, in um, Canvas, I'm getting more engagement than I was in other, other areas. Um, and I think it's important to, to say hello to them every day to be available. Um, as we all said, so if it's class time on Canvas chat in one window, um, in Google meeting, they have in their welcome message that they get every class period, they've got the address for where they can come in and say hello. Um, another thing with empathy is be their situation. Um, with painting, some of them can't do it. They've got a house full of uh, children, siblings, parents, and roommates, people with health conditions. They can't bust out chemicals in the kitchen. Uh, so that's been a, a big part of me having to understand 
I cannot have the same expectations I once had. Um, and part of that empathy is then that I'm going through a lot of the same struggle with them. So for instance, this is a great out right now, but uh, because of COVID, I've decided to leave my um, off-site art studio and move everything back into the house to save uh, a couple hundred bucks a month. And this is a, a disaster right now, um, but I'm walking them through a video showing them that I'm going through the same thing, showing, showing them my challenge, um, challenges I have to overcome. And I'm finding being just upfront with them has, has been a good, good result um, as far as engagement. And I want to say um, empathy is for ourselves too. Again, we're not normal. So we have to remember that we, we can't work 20 hours a day on this. We can't take every tip we hear from every person online. And goodness gracious, if I get an email about some that's going to help me become a better teacher, um, I delete those. So we can't neglect our research and we can't neglect our mental health. Um, if we're healthy, we can help our students be healthy. Uh, so that's, that's important to me this semester so far. Uh, thank you so much, Sean. That's all really important stuff. I'm glad you talked about the empathy. And um, okay, so thank you so much to panelists. We're going to open up now for questions. Um, so if something one of the panelists said um, sparked an idea for you, please go ahead and put that question out there. Um, I'll I will go first. Um, one of my questions for you all is, um, what types of challenges have students shared with you that we should all consider and be aware of? You, know, you, don't, you don't have to tell us specifics, but just what kinds of things are people experiencing? I, from my experience, um, students, there, there's a number of students who've just expressed either just general anxiety about the situation, whether it's due to an actual health uh, scenario with them or their family, or just just the the mental toll it takes, you know, of not being able to resume your daily normal life, and so I think that has at least been the most common one, you know, you know, situation that I've run into with with uh, the students. For for me, you know, many of my students have said that the workload has doubled. Um, and I, I, I know that for, for my course, you know, I actually pulled back on some work, but, you know, I, I, I don't know in what specific contents, but a, context, but a lot of them think the work has doubled. Um, but then also their work has doubled because, again, same comments. Many of them, um, in one particular case, both parents are now unemployed and my student is working more. Um, so it's kind of the, the workload. And then for a number of my students, what is really weighing on them most heavily is that their professional school application kind of pathway and their timeline has been postponed and delayed. So they're very worried about their future after college and they had a timeline, they had a plan and that plan has been upended. So. Katie, when you say the, the workload has doubled it, do you mean the, the work for your class or for all classes? For my class, no. My, my workload has not doubled, but my students say that the comments in email is, um, sorry, uh, you know, double the work, double, you know, double, double the schoolwork, double the actual work, the, the employment work. So... Some, some, sometimes this is, uh, this is actual, sometimes it's just perceived based on my experiences with students in online at, uh, scenarios. And part of that is the reason is, I think, because in an in-person class, you can look around the room and say, okay, who has questions about this? And you might get a hand or you get there all just nodding, we got it. Whereas in an online setting, you kind of have to ask have an assignment or ask a question or design a quiz to get that kind of feedback a lot of times to see follow along where the students are running into problems right. and so in some cases it maybe does create a little bit more work and i think we right. need to understand that right I, I can see that so my class um one of my classes was a you know a three-hour block class one evening a week 
and it was full discussion, but that, that was in class. And so now that discussion has moved to the online discussion boards, which is now an assignment. So I, I think that you're right, David. Um, but you know, for me, I, I see it as just, okay, this is, the discussion was in class and now it's online, but I can see how they interpret that as an assignment. Yeah, and sometimes too, it's also just perceived that way because I think some students feel like doing assigned reading is more of a chore than just going to a class and being part of an interactive lecture. And so right. I, I think, you know, part of it is a perception issue as well, you know, but there are some real aspects. Right. Melissa, I saw a question there about the disappeared. What, what, what are we doing with those? Yeah, so um, lots of lots of good comments in the chat. Um, students who are having a hard time living at home again, being with their parents all the time. Um, students who have increased work schedules or changed work schedules, so they're not able to make regular class meetings. Um, I know a lot of folks, a lot of instructors have gone to asynchronous classes just because schedules are so complicated right now, given family responsibilities, work, all that kind of stuff. Um, there are also comments here about difficult internet connections. Um, so Kimberly, that seems really difficult if you're teaching online acting, or I've heard this from other folks in the arts who are teaching music, um, dance, you need to be present and see each other in real time and without excellent internet connectivity, that's impossible. And then, yeah, this question about the disappeared students who have sort of dropped off. Um, it's helpful to get the university progress report and hope advisors will have more success reaching out. Um, Lisa, can I add something right there? Yeah. I think one thing that I've, uh, that we've actually as a department, we've tried to emphasize this is to uh, be proactive as an instructor to pay attention to those students who are either falling behind or, uh, or having problems in an online setting and to, uh, you know, don't let too much time pass before you actively reach out to that student. And you can have a, you know, ready-made email ready for, you know, for, for reach out to these students and just insert name at the top. But, um, but I found just, just that little bit of reaching out and connection, you know, in, in a lot of cases has been helpful for the students to, to respond and be like, oh yeah, actually I have had some problems and I put this on the back burner. Is it okay if I can catch back up or, or I have this serious problem? Is it okay if I come back in two weeks or something like that? Mm -hmm. And Brian has a really good um, tip here that he's um, been reaching out personally via email uh, rather than just big group announcements. Students are more likely to respond to that. Um, and Kimberly, you have cell phone numbers. So reaching out personally that way is working yeah, that, out. Oh, sorry. That was my question about the students who had just disappeared here mm -hmm. for me. <laughs> I'll show myself. Um, but um, I, I have reached out and got the ones that I'm most concerned about. I mean, I have heard back from some based on my personal emails and um, but there are a couple that it's just been absolute radio silence. And at that point, I don't have cell phone numbers. I don't have Gmail addresses. I, I feel like there's really not much more I can do. Mm -hmm. In the art department, our chair has been um, very supportive with getting us cell phone numbers and getting us um, emails, any contact information for these for students who have dropped off. And, and, and the, the good news of the story is uh, um, through direct contact, we've, we've brought a lot of students back in. We've been able to navigate their um, concerns, why they disappeared. On the other hand, um, I think we're gonna lose a few. And, 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 I, and knowing why helps me uh, process it, except that you know, this, is, this is really, really bad for some students. Um, but while I process that, it's the last chance to connect them with um, emergency services, food services, et cetera. And that's at least a, a closure, knowing that we, we, I'm gonna lose a student, but we've done our best as an institution to, to navigate them um, through, through events that are out of our control.
We have some questions and discussion here about group work too. Um, Brian, do you wanna share what you're doing about group work and then anyone else who's working on that, feel free to chime in. Okay, um, yeah, just briefly, um, I'm teaching two uh, intro site courses in the Honors College um, and it's a, a normal part of our curriculum that um, I assign um, a group project. And fortunately, uh, the establishment of the groups, as I mentioned, had already happened prior to spring break. Um, and as this was starting to ramp up, um, I could sense the direction that we were going and I was able to give them some warning and kind of let them know that, hey, you know what, this group project is going to continue no matter what here. Um, but we are going to have to make some adjustments. And one of those adjustments is that I make very brief assignments where students both update progress as a group. How are things going? Are you progressing as well? If not, what are the challenges? What strategies have you used to overcome them? Are they working? Um, you know, that kind of thing, um, as well as, as individual progress. And, uh, you know, there have been a couple hiccups um, over the last week or so, but when I do these group projects, uh, and their normal circumstances, there are often a couple hiccups as well. Um, that being said, you know, coming up in a couple weeks, we'll we'll see how things go. But th that's what I've been doing so far. One thing to to kind of build on that a little bit is that I found that breaking discussions into a smaller groups. Uh, has been a helpful way to get uh, students to feel a little bit more connected because there's not the intimidation or the bystander effect of, oh, someone else will contribute, you know, because there's, you know, so many other students. When you have a smaller group, they might feel a little bit more, uh, less intimidated and less more willing to share, you know, with each other. Got to use your personality for sure. What can I ask for an, in the online setting, what's an appropriate discussion group size? I mean, is it, is it five students? You know, could you, could you group with 10? I, I think from my experience, either of those numbers are great. Um, I've been dealing with some of the same issues. My class is very large, mm -hmm. you know, with over a hundred students in there. And so uh, just in my view, anything yeah, you know, smaller than that yeah. was going to be, you know, a uh, tremendous, in, you know, uh, help. And so I, I have tried to, you know, go down to about 10 ish, you know. Katie, what are you trying to accomplish with that group? This is Rebecca um, from the law school. What, I think that that kind of goes to what size group should be. Well, um, for I, an, an upper level class, I do in class group work and I rotate the groups. They're kind of comfortable with that, with shuffling up the people that they're talking to each week. And that works fine. Um, you know, the, the push of active learning in these introductory courses includes group work. And it's been interesting. I've noticed like students, they don't know how to work in a group. It makes them very uncomfortable. And, you know, sitting in a classroom, they just want the instructor to tell them what they need to know. So I, I, I want them to basically be able to, to, to connect in a group and basically be comfortable passing the mic and every person is expected to sound off. Um, and I mean, I really, my, my goal is just to get them comfortable talking to another student using scientific vocabulary. Um, I mean, I would think that smaller would be better unless there's a reason. I mean, you can say obvious, but I teach a, um, a wills and trust course, for example, um, that has 90 students and I have them, I assign them to groups of three or four right from the beginning. And then every class I'll have maybe three, three or four groups that are on call. Right. And so, um, but the three or four, as opposed to 10, um, keeps pretty much means everyone has to participate with, I think with larger ones, you still can be four of them can just tune out or five, you know, that kind of thing. The idea is to try and kind of force them into groups that are small enough that they, you know, have to participate. But that, that's just my experience. Right. I guess I just wondered if there was 
if there was a difference between in-person group numbers and online, you know, online discussion group numbers, if one worked, I agree with you. My intuition would be keep it small, but I just wondered if, I, you know, if, if online, you know, bigger groups worked. Yeah, I mean, I've been doing online breakouts, but um, I've, I've, they've all been here for. Okay. Um, okay. Because I'm just wondering if for the future, you know, I mean, we're all picking up some techniques that might work, you know, a little online experience that does work for a majorly in-person lecture. Mm -hmm. And if my students are uncomfortable talking, to my, you know, I'm talking about my, my, my freshmen, my, my lower level students, but if they're uncomfortable talking to each other in class, um, you know, maybe an online environment might be a good place for them to go, you know, with, when we all can meet back in a lecture room again. Um, but I, I feel like certainly for my introductory class, I've, I've lost a lot of that connectivity um, that, that, and it's unfortunate. Although my, this is our, our test three round. So we have five sections of this class going and apparently for the other two sections, there's 115 students enrolled in these sections and 110 students took the, the test. So that's good news to, to, to say that our students are at least still there. And I expect when my test is next week, I'll get the same numbers, I hope. I mean, my, the law school has gone to a complete pass fail system. So there's no option for grades. They don't get to see a grade. They don't, um, and pass being a D minus, seriously. <laughs> so um, I have only taught small courses this semester, 18 students, and, um, and it's been great for the small courses as it's turned out. But I, I keep thinking there are things that are gonna be different if we have to continue some of this in the fall, um, assuming they're doing it for grades. Right, and I know the university is some level of pass fail, and that just has to affect a good number of students in their in their engagement. So, I'm not sure what to do with that. I just think that it's affecting things. Yeah. Um, a couple of other things that have come up in the chat um, regarding students who've sort of fallen off the radar, who you can't get in touch with. Um, Beth. Uh, posted information about the rebel support team. So those are folks um, who will take your referrals. Um, I, I posted the website there too. So reach out to the rebel support team and they can um, try and get in touch with students if you're worried about folks. Um, Kathy and Kim have both posted ideas about daily communication in terms of just like having a format and making it clear and consistent every day. What are we covering? What's the homework? Um, what has most recently passed that you may need to catch up on? That seems super helpful. Um, another thing uh, that Yvonne asked and that I would love to know as well is um, just what would be helpful to you all as faculty members? I'm going to put our list of upcoming events in here, but if there are things that you need that um, you know, you're not getting from your department, that you haven't heard from the provost or from the faculty center, and there are things that we could do as a university community to support you, um, let me know. Um, oh, Gerald, you're coming from a healthcare setting. Do you want to say anything about that? Good morning. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. So it really is a difficult scenario for students because they're not able to go into the sim labs to work. They can't go into the clinics to work except for emergency care. Our faculty have to redesign exams so that we can basically improve the feedback between students during this time that uh, we can have scores that don't have faculty that are there to provide our uh, examination. Normally we have multiple faculty that uh, are calibrated to give feedback and we're just in a difficult scenario trying to develop all of these uh, scenarios for us. I feel quite uh, sad for the patients as well because our clinics are closed and there's a lot of patients that really uh, are in the middle of treatment that um, I'm sure it's difficult for them as well. 
but the students were we're looking at sixty thousand dollars a year per student and they're just dead in the water along with with a lot of others but i appreciate the time to uh to be in this conference and hear how other faculty members are dealing with uh, these online scenarios thank you yeah thanks for sharing that um I think about students who are meant to be doing different kinds of practica this semester, like student teaching or, you know, other sort of hands on experiences that have just been shut down by all of this. And it's definitely a concern. One thing that is easy for me, going to be a lot harder for other teachers is I, I teach all three steps of my, my program. Um, so I've already, um, and it's good for me, but uh, I've already accepted that part of the fall semester, if we're back, is going to be a catch up of what we've lost one on one in the first semester. Um, and I don't know how, how maybe other people who are in different situations want to talk about how they might want to address dealing with that in the fall when they get students who simply are, are not as prepared prerequisite wise for their classes as they should be. Can I say something? <laughs> so I'm teaching math and I'm actually very worried about that stuff that uh, you know we can um, loosen up things and so on and pull back on some stuff you know and uh, have assignments, I don't know, maybe more reasonable for this uh, type of the year and so on. Uh, but afterwards, when, um, you know, we go back to whatever normality will look <laughs> at some point, um, it may affect, and it will affect for sure. Uh, but on the other side, I'm sure also that something will, um, even out, there will be some balance between all these things. So during my third year of college, almost my entire spring semester was canceled. The country went under the NATO bombing. So we did not have any classes. <laughs> we did not have any emails. There was no communication at all. And lots of students were actually, they dropped uh, I mean, the college during those times and so on. But then at the end, really the professors were the ones that pulled us back. I remember in fall, and really carry that over from that uh, semester to the next one and so on. So um, I actually really understand from the student perspective how hard it can be when really there's zero communication between. And uh, I think now we have more tools, so we'll survive somehow. There will be some effects um, and things like that. But I don't know <laughs> how uh, it, it will all uh, develop even for math. Um, especially uh, when they go afterwards so in the next, let's say, class where this will be their prerequisite that they are taking right now. Thanks for sharing that perspective, Monica, and your experience. Um, Kimberly is saying that her department is thinking ahead for thinking about online teaching in the fall helping graduate students think about teaching, acting right away online. Um, are other folks already making plans, thinking about um, contingencies for fall? From, from our department's perspective, we, uh, we actually were, had a little bit of a leg up on this because uh, we were Couple, one of the guinea pigs for the uh, MGM online uh, degree program. And so, uh, so we've already been uh, starting to uh, plot, make a plan to plot out uh, the construction of online courses, review existing ones and things of that nature. So, so that's kind of given us at least, uh, you know, kind of a head start on it, but I can imagine in other departments, this can be something of a, of a whirlwind rush in terms of getting these things going? We're thinking, um, I mentioned we work with hazardous materials um, in, our, in our labs. Uh, even expecting that we'll be in fall, you know, we expect that in uh, November they call it and we're back home again. Um, and it's making us, A, not have to rethink 
by changing our materials, we have to change the entire method of, of our demo, how we construct what um, we're asking the students to do, the assignments. It's, it's basically a rewrite of the course. Um, and then you throw on the stress of, um, I've been talking to a major art supplier who's telling me, yeah, get ready for your supply chain issues in fall where the students might not get materials and you might not order materials. Um, so I, um, so I, I, it goes back to my advice. I talked to one person, which sounds pithy for us, but I was like, forget if we're online, what if we were teaching this horse and buggy in the apocalypse? How are we going to get knowledge to these students? You know, um, it's been done before. There was a time in 1900 when art was being made. Um, so, so for us, it's, it's just, a big conversation, what is the most important thing we're at? And if that's all we can teach for the next semester, then, then that's the best we, we can do. And we have to but be, but let that be our focus. I'm not looking forward to it. <laughs> yeah, I think it's important that we don't uh, underestimate our students. You know, they are pretty resilient. And uh, more than a few of my students currently, you know, remember uh, one October and we're students here already when that uh, occurred. And um, I just think we, um, we have to do everything we can for, but we got to uh, uh, acknowledge their toughness and um, we should, you know, try our best to communicate that to them somehow. I'm, I'm in, uh, in awe of our students. They've um, done incredibly well, at least in my section, uh, they've done incredibly well uh, in hanging, hanging, hanging on and doing their work and staying up to date. Um, uh, I don't know if I could have done it. So to, uh, to sort of finish this out on a positive note, um, I'd love to hear from panelists and from anyone else, what's working really well in your now remote class um, that, wouldn't, that wouldn't have even been possible face to face. So let's uh, share anything that's um, just going really well that you wanna share with others that they might try. I, I personally think that the, the smaller targeted discussion groups are a great thing, especially compared to the large, you know, equivalent of an in-person group, because, uh, you know, with a group, group of 100 students, it's like herding cats trying to create uh, small group discussions within that classroom, whereas online, uh, that's something that's worked out more effectively. And to kind of just add one more small thing to it, one thing that I've learned about discussions, too, is make sure you put some thought into the, uh, the prompts or the questions that you're using, because I found that some uh, questions elicit kind of a canned response from students, whereas others, you know, really will get them to think a little bit more. I would say um, moving into online discussion boards has been really beneficial for my class to get more of an idea of where the students are connecting what we're learning in class to their worlds. Um, and so that's been a big positive as far as planning the class and, and, and even, even coming up with prompts that will facilitate in-class discussion, which we can hopefully do someday too. So that's been very positive. Also, you know, learning, learning how Canvas can help me do some testing, can actually make, make testing a little bit easier um, with question pools and things like that. I mean, I, I've, I had never had to do that before and it's been a really interesting thing to learn and I think it will improve, can be a way to improve some assessment. I found that um, moving critiques online, there's a, this is an extreme example, but it applies to many. Um, but the extreme example is I have a student who's uh, high, high on the autism spectrum. And uh, this is my third semester with this student. And his comments online are, are phenomenal. And have never in one-on-one -on -one interaction or in group interaction have never, never seen that, did not know that he had um, inside there. And so it's, it's made me aware that moving forward that I have, I have to try to incorporate more modes of communication um, because I think, I'm, I think I've been missing people by mainly concentrating only on the live interaction. Uh, so that, that's been very positive.
Yeah, some uh, some advantages coming out in the chat. Um, the fact that online discussions can give every student a voice is a real positive. Yep, thanks for sharing that, Brian. And Roberta points out that five minute Panopto recordings on weekly readings have worked well. So students are sharing um, in that mode. And real time feedback in chat. Thank you, Kathy. No, that's nice. I'd like to add the communication we've all been talking about. One thing going forward is um, I've relied on the syllabus as being my roadmap, thinking that the students look at it. And Yvonne um, uh, showed me that showed us this thing in Canvas where we could see what's been interacted with. My syllabus is one of the least interacted with documents <laughs> in the entire thing. Um, so I think moving forward, I'm going to start doing weekly um, look aheads uh, via email um, to say, this is what we're doing. This is what we're looking forward. And so that they have an idea of what their week's going to look like. Because I, I assume 90% of them have been walking in without knowing what they're doing. Yeah, I found uh, along those lines, I found that the syllabus is not as frequently viewed and that uh, repeating key ideas that you may be placed in the syllabus throughout the course, you know, can help. Yeah. We did. Um, one thing that we have done from a, a, a course wide are these uh, weekly or every other week check in surveys, which, which, and I should have mentioned this before, but it, it's more like, you know, how are you doing? Are you, or how, you know, what's your level of feeling overwhelmed or do you feel comfortable? Are you hopeful for the future? And we've been doing those for our introductory courses every other week, and they get extra credit. You know if they if they participate so you know that that has been uh helpful and it should continue and i should be checking in every few weeks anyway with even an in-person course so katie I'm, I'm curious about that if if um we had a, a sample survey sent to us from um college of liberal arts and I just, I was going to send it out and then I thought, are we just surveying our students to death? I mean, if they're getting this not only at the college level, but they're getting it from all of their classes, it's like, if they're already feeling stressed and we're asking them, how stressed are you feeling? Is that even reinforcing? Or, no, but right. I totally agree with checking in with them. I, I, I know. Right. No, I agree. All I can say is, you know, it's the surveys are coming out of the ed psych department. So hopefully they have some idea of um, the psychology behind um, that much checking in. You, but, you know, I guess you're right. I, I hadn't thought about it that way. But, you know, I, I've been annoyed at all of the emails from Delta Airlines that I get each week telling me about my, uh, you know, my credit and I agree, but I'm offering them extra credit to do them. So at least there's something, <laughs> there's some benefit, you know, I, I don't know. And yeah, and, and one alternative version with that is just simple, you know, ask one poll question, you know, use a Google form or something like that. Mm -hmm. And that way it's just one, you know, kind of snapshot yeah. in there. That... Yeah. All right. Well, it is um, just about that time that we're going to wrap this up. I want to say thank you again to all the panelists for your positive energy, for your great advice, for sharing your experience. And thanks to our attendees as well for um, being open with your experience and your questions and for sharing this time. So um, please do join us again. We're doing meditation every Wednesday. We are here to um, support you in whatever way we can. So um, let me know at facultycenter at unlv.edu if there are other opportunities that you would like to uh, get together, talk, um, get some expert advice from folks. So thank you all, and we'll see you soon. Thanks, Melissa. Thank you.